I'm revealing a little bit about my past and unveiling a new garden home design in today's show. Hope you'll stick around. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Well, here we are at 18th and Gaines, an important place to me. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to the Garden Home, and welcome to my neighborhood. You see, several years ago, well, as a matter of fact, many years ago, when my parents brought me home from the hospital as a newborn, I was taken to a house way down on Gaines. That's where we lived. So this really does feel like home. As a matter of fact, my great-great-grandparents over 100 years ago had a house several blocks to the north. Now, my mom, a couple of years ago, came to me and she said, hey, I just found something I think you'll find interesting. She said, take a look at this. It was a picture of me at two years old in the front yard. And she said, see, you're already not happy with the way the front yard looked and you're gonna change it. You have a trowel in your hand. <laughs> so you can see, I didn't have much choice in what I was gonna do. So I guess I was just destined to be a garden designer. Now, this neighborhood, since my childhood, has become a historic neighborhood. It's full of 19th century houses with beautiful gardens and deep porches, handsome churches, and even the governor's mansion. As you can see, it's a great neighborhood, and I feel really lucky to live here. You know, I draw inspiration from this place every day. Now, I've given you a little glimpse into my past, but let's talk about the future now. You see, I've got a project that I think you're gonna be really excited about. So let's head down to the design studio and roll out a few blueprints. <laughs> Now I wanted to share with you that early gardening experience because I think that it's so formative and important. It certainly was to me, and you probably have a similar one in your own past. And I think it's important for all of us as adults to get out there and mentor a child, help them get into the garden, get their hands in the soil and grow something. It's a great way for them to connect with nature. Well, I'm getting off topic because what we're really here to talk about is the future and this project, this house and garden that I'm building. You know, for the last 10 years or more, I've been working out of a 100 by 150 foot lot. The house is in the center, and every square inch of that has been planted many, many times. You see, even though it has nine distinct garden rooms surrounding the house, well, now it's time to step out and paint on a new canvas. Now, this house and garden will be on 20 acres, which will give me lots of room to do all kinds of things. Now, there are a lot of different components to this, but the one that I'm really excited about is the fact that the gardens, and especially this colossal vegetable garden, will be all organic. And as far as the house goes, well, we're gonna use methodologies and products that have low impact on the environment. Now, this is all about going green, and going green can be costly, certainly up front, and it can also be time consuming. But you know, I think it's worth it. In the long haul, it's better on the environment and it's better on my wallet. Now, some of these approaches you may have already heard about, you know, such as solar power or energy efficient windows and doors, but we're also gonna look into things like soybean insulation. Yeah, that sounds outrageous, doesn't it? But it really works. So you may be wondering where I've come up with these ideas and products that allow this project to be so green. Well, I had an opportunity to attend the International Builders Show in Orlando, Florida. Now, this is a colossal show. Now, there are local versions of this show around the country. They're not as big, but they can be as informative. At the show, I had an opportunity to learn about green initiatives being taken by companies in all areas of the building industry. Now, over the course of this series, I'll be bringing you experts that will be helping me make choices, the best choices for creating a green project and I hope that this information will help you when it's time for you to build a home. Or maybe you're just gonna replace a glass sliding door, or put in a heating and air system, or even paint your house. All the information will apply. Now I'm really excited about building green, and I have to say I'm thrilled that so many mainstream manufacturers are getting on the green bandwagon. But I will tell you this, that there have been a few bumps along the way on the construction schedule.
think the outside of this old house looks bad. You should have seen the inside. It was a complete wreck. This is a day I've been looking forward to for a long time. What we're doing here is completely demolishing this old building, and we're going to start with a brand new garden home. Now, that was several months ago when the old structure came down. And there's been quite a bit of activity out here on the garden home project since then, mainly in the garden. We've had some delays with the cottage. You see, we ran into some bad weather during the late winter, so it delayed the digging of the foundation for the cottage. You can see it's underway here, but rather than the foundation of a house, it looks more like an archaeological dig, don't you think? Okay, so we're behind schedule. You can't control the weather, so there's no reason for me to get upset about it. And after all, I have to say, during the delay, I learned how to make this house even greener. And that's my goal. I want to use current methodologies and products that will make this place more planet-friendly and energy efficient. We're going to take a look at things like collecting rainwater off the roof, solar energy, as well as radiant heat, just to name a few. And there's a lot going on around here. The garden's coming along and the landscape is looking really good. Come on, Angel. Good girl. Oh, the sights and the sounds of summer. There's nothing quite like it. And when you can see beautiful wildflowers like this, well, for me, it just puts me at ease. You know, these are all so comfortable together. Just look at the colors blue, pale lavender, all punctuated with these little dots of yellow and orange. Now, as the summer unfolds, what will happen is we'll move away from these soft pastels and blue tones to warmer tones, to golds and yellows and orange and hot reds. Now, some of the specific flowers we see in bloom today include these beautiful larkspur. They're tall and spiky, and they're flowering next to blue cornflowers or bachelor buttons. They come in a range of blue to mauve to purple, even pink and white. Now, if you look a little closer, you can begin to see some of those warmer colors coming through. It's funny how as the summer temperatures come up, so does the color palette. It warms up as well. And you can see this through flowers like the Gallardia, Black-Eyed Susan, and Coreopsis. Now, let's face it. While this is beautiful, it may be a look that's not for everyone. If you love a beautifully groomed lawn and clipped hedges, well, this may not work for you. You see, wildflowers to be beautiful like this year in and year out, they have to go through their entire life cycle. They have to be able to produce seed. Those seeds have to mature, and then they drop to the ground, and then the next spring they come up and do it all over again. But there are ways to use wildflowers around your home if you're really crazy about them. Let's stop by and visit with Carl Hunter, who's authored books on the subject of wildflowers and makes good use of them around his home. I like to tell people when they come to visit my yard and when I have these different groups that come, to, I consider all my friends that what's going on here is just an average uh, city lot. There's a lot larger and, and some smaller, but within a yard, if you pick all the different spots, shady spots and sunny spots and places that you can grow flowers, and there's a wide variety of areas that wildflowers will grow in that a lot can be done just on a fairly small tract of land. So I like for people to know that when they come here. If you've got just little plots here and there that are fairly free of grass and weeds the size of card tables, you'd be surprised how many flowers you can grow in a little area like that and pick a bouquet at least every other day or so and never miss them. I would recommend to people that already have established lawns and shrubbery and so on that they uh, use old beds where maybe roses have failed or any clean ground and just go right ahead and plant. And uh, you can plant annuals uh, in the spring and enjoy those flowers and then come along in the fall and plant perennials. It's a strange thing, but uh, in cultivated flowers or in arranging yards, many people uh, go through a lot of uh, thought as to whether they want reds with pinks and all different combinations, but in nature, all the colors are often together and nobody thinks about this being a clash. So I don't think it makes a lot of difference what colors you use, just use colors that you like to plant in your garden. And uh, here in this garden, I've, I've put all different kinds of flowers together for shade and sun and I put them in small groups so that you have lots of choices as to what you would like. For instance, black-eyed Susans and Coreopsis and many of these real common flowers are in every state in the union. When you have a wildflower garden with 10 to 20 species in it, you're going to have color 
pretty much through the year, through the whole growing season at least. And at this time, one of our brightest flowers is one of the evening primroses, which is a beautiful series of flowers. These bright yellow flowers that are about an inch and a half to up to two inches across are in full bloom right now, along with the blue spiderworts, which go so well with them, I think. And uh, these are all hardy plants, require no spraying, no fertilizing, no pruning, no mulching. This is why people are going so strong for wildflowers. They're so carefree. If you think back on it, uh, nobody's taking care of them out there in the woods or on the roadsides, and they've been here for forever. In fact, in spite of mowing and spraying uh, in many areas, they're still here. They survived that. It's astonishing the number of wildflower species that grow across this country. Every region seems to have its favorites, like the blue bonnets of Texas and all of those California poppies. And in the northeast and north central parts of this country alone, there are over 1,200 species. Many of these varieties are at their best or showiest in the spring and summer along roadsides and meadows. But one of the best times to sow the seed is actually during the late summer and early fall. If you plant during this period, you want to make sure that your plants have enough time to germinate and establish themselves before the first hard frost. That's usually about eight weeks. And it's critical you keep plenty of moisture in the soil during this time. If you don't have time to plant them this fall, you can plant them in the very early spring. Getting them in the ground is a snap. Just break up the soil in your garden down to about three inches. This will ensure good seed to soil contact. If you're working with a larger area, a rototiller can make this job a lot easier. Many wildflower seeds are very tiny, so to get even distribution when sowing, it's a good idea to mix the seed with an inert material like dry sand. And I don't advise using fertilizer because this seems to just encourage weeds. One last thing, if you use one of these wildflower seed mixes, you'll find that they contain both annuals and perennials. The annuals will bloom this spring, but many of the perennials will take two years to flower, so you have to be patient. When I'm planting in my garden, I can't resist trying some of the new varieties of plants, along with some of my old standbys. But some of the old ones are just so good, they can't be improved upon, like Larkspur. Creating this kind of beauty in your garden is easy with this tough, cool weather annual. Larkspur is an excellent bloom to use in arrangements, both fresh and as a dried flower. Vast fields are grown for the flower industry just for this purpose. Larkspur seed can be sown directly into the garden in the fall, in warm areas of the country, or in the early spring where winters are severe. Larkspur planted with other annuals and among your perennials and shrubs can make a long-lasting and beautiful impression in your garden. Now I want to go back to a point I made earlier. You see it's all about life cycles and recognizing them. If you want this sort of beauty to persist year after year, you have to recognize the life cycle of the plant. This Larkspur is completely finished with its flowering. but You can see all of these pods and each one is packed full of seed allowed to mature, they drop to the ground, next year we'll have another drift equally beautiful. Now let's focus on another plant we love, the daffodil. Last year this field was full of thousands of gorgeous blooms in every shade of white and yellow you can imagine. Now for daffodils to complete their life cycle, you have to let the foliage die back completely. That's what we're doing here. We're letting all of those stems and foliage die to the ground and then we'll mow off the field. You see, if you want beautiful blooms like these, you've got to leave the foliage intact and let it die back naturally. It's the foliage that reinvigorates the bulb so that next year you have a plethora of blooms. Now, I brought you into my workshop because I want to describe a project that many of you, I think, can relate to. I was in a shop a few days ago and found this wonderful vintage French chair. Actually, it's a part of a set, a love seat, a couple other chairs, and a solid metal table. The chair and the love seat are made of wood and metal. Now, I love this patina. You can see that the uh, paint is flaking just a bit, and I want to preserve that. And what I've discovered over the years is that I can lightly sand the wood and the metal for that matter, and spray it with several coats of water sealer, and that will help stabilize this finish, which I think is really good looking. Now, the table had a few problems. The rust was really coming through the thin metal top, so I took the table to a local shop that specializes in sandblasting. There they knocked off the old paint and got it ready for its new finish. 
Next, the table went to a local powder coating shop where they put the polish on the apple, so to speak. This gave the table new life for years in the garden. Now, before we leave the chair completely, there's a couple of tips I want to give you. You know, for me, I like things in the garden that have a certain patina. I don't necessarily like things that look bright and shiny. But with something like this, say you want to give it a new lease on life, you could paint it a different color. Maybe you just paint the wood bits. Or you could just take and accent it with some throw pillows. It adds comfort and some stylish beauty. You can buy these pre-made or you can make them yourself. And it's just a way to give a chair or an ensemble a new lease on life. Welcome to the design studio. You know, I get a real kick out of taking a blank slate like this and coming up with ideas for the landscape. You know, really the best compositions are those where the landscape and the architecture of the home work in harmony. They work together. So let's point out a few things about this structure that are really working for it. A few of the details I like include the steps here. You can see these are made of big slabs of native stone really a nice detail and you can see the same thing over here on this little hyphen between the house and the garage. Now what I like about this space is that I think it affords us an opportunity here for some sort of gathering place and I think we may want to use this as an opportunity to divide what is the service area which is the garage over there to the right and what really becomes the entryway into this place. Now, it doesn't have a porch, so we want to bump up the charm factor, and there's some ways we can do this. Okay, now what I'd like to do is add to the built landscape and add just a little bit of hardscape here. Now, I think that this would be a great space over here for some sort of patio. If we could match this stone, that would be fantastic, and bring a path that would come along the front of the house and there is one existing but it's very close to the foundation and what I'd like to do is bump that out to about six feet from the foundation of the house at least and then come to a landing say a pad that's four to six feet larger than the path itself so that when guests come they can gather here in front of the house and come on in the door so I try to match the stone and create this space maybe here's where we could place a pair of large containers maybe a large pair of classically designed urns on each side. And then the path might continue on around and come to this end of the house where here we could do some sort of a hedge with an arch in it where you literally would grow an evergreen hedge, maybe it's in hemlock, maybe it's in holly, where you could bring the path around and go around through this side of the house. So this entire corner would be an evergreen with a clipped arch. And all you have to use is a metal frame there to define the arch and this will allow you to follow that iron form and keep the arch clipped over time. Now what I like about a device like this is that it creates a sense of mystery. You don't know what's beyond that hedge and that arch and so you're compelled to walk around into the back garden. Now across the foundation I want to keep it very simple. Houses of this period really didn't have a lot of foundation plantings. They don't really want to violate the, the simplicity of it. So probably what I would do here is just punctuate the corners with maybe a U or a boxwood, maybe one here, here, and here, just like that. And we might even come in just between the windows with one that's slightly smaller. And the space between the foundation of the house and the path would be some sort of a ground cover with a few ferns or Solomon seal. These would make great plants across the front of this house. Okay, now what I'd like to do is talk about a fence that would come out so we contain a garden very near the house. And what I'd like to do there is make that fence about 16 feet out from the house. So what we have is six feet from the foundation to the path. And we have another four feet, which is the path itself, and then another six feet. So we get a total of 16 feet, and this fence would run across like this, with a gate in the center, and then one all the way down here, a section of fence that would run to this corner. It would be a picket fence, and this reminds me of a house that I love very much. It's a New England salt box. 
that has a beautiful weathered patina on the wood and a beautiful old picket fence across the front. So we'd have a picket fence here which would allow us to keep a garden just inside this fence. And this would also help with deer problems. We'd have a gate here with a pair of posts on each side, so probably a double gate. Now, this fence provides the perfect opportunity to grow all kinds of old-fashioned roses across it or vining plants such as morning glories or sweet peas, which would really sort of bump up the charm factor here. Now, down here on this end, I think that the fence should tie in with another gate just here. So if you parked in the driveway, you would come through the gate, you would enter into this space, which is just outside these doors, but then along the driveway itself, coming toward us, I'd like to see a low hedge planted so when you're in this garden or when you're in this room and you're looking out, you don't see the drive and possibly even cars that are parked over there on that side. I'd like to screen those out. Okay, now what I might do is then take that evergreen hedge, whatever that material is, and come back in front of the picket fence on each side and place a pair of those here and here. Now let me just draw those in blue so you can see them a little better. There we go, each side of the gate. Now, in front of the picket fence, I could see daffodils. They'd be beautiful planted all along the edge of this fence. And then on the inside of the garden, from the walkway over to the picket fence, it's the perfect place for all kinds of cottage annuals and perennials, like hollyhocks, Siberian iris, peonies, and summer flocks. So what we've created here is a wonderful, traditional country garden. Now, if you've ever built a house or remodeled one, you know that you spend a lot of time daydreaming about how you're going to arrange the rooms, what's going to go in them. And I found myself assessing what I have and what I think I need to buy to sort of pull the rooms together. But you know, at the forefront of my thinking, I keep coming back to comfort and durability. After all, this is going to be a gardener's cottage, so there'll be plenty of muddy boots and wear and tear. Now let's take this chair, for instance. You see, this is one I found several years ago in a second-hand shop. I didn't really pay much for it, because you can see the upholstery is in pretty bad shape, but I love its classic lines. Well, a month or so ago, I pulled it out of storage and thought, you know, I'm going to slip cover this chair. And I did, and I'm really pleased with the results. Now what's interesting about this fabric, these weather-resistant fabrics, is that they're virtually indestructible. They hold their color and they're stain resistant. So this experiment by slip covering this chair, I think is fairly successful. So as I begin to pull together the fabrics and the furnishings for the inside of the cottage, thinking, you know, I may cover a few sofas and chairs with this stuff. After all, I've been known to make a mess in the garden and bring it inside. Now you may be wondering, where can I find this stuff? While I first saw this type of fabric at a trade show several years ago, I was pleased recently to walk into a local fabric shop and find a whole section dedicated to all-weather fabric in these bright and bold patterns. They're so accessible. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. You know, there's so many things I want to share with you about building green. So over the next few months, together we'll be looking at ways to create beautiful gardens and sustainable houses, all green and with style. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. There's progress at the Garden Home construction site. Walls are going up in the garden and I'm getting a report back on the water quality. From soaker hoses and drip irrigation to taking care of slugs and mosquito problems, we'll tackle a range of topics in this show. Looking forward to our visit in the garden home.